The way that you feel about yourself speaks volumes not only to other people, but to God. So many people in the Bible that fell short of where they should be is because they started looking at their self. They started thinking about their shortcomings and how they wouldn't be able to succeed. And the, mom, the one I want to talk about this morning is Moses. Moses has a plethora of examples in his life for us to glean from. And I talk about him often in my stories because there's so much there. But what I'm going to talk about today is how that God has a plan for you and I. For everyone that was created, there was a plan that came with you. But his plan is his preference for you and I. Just because it's his plan doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen in your life. I've heard people say before, well, it was spoken over me that I would be such and such, and it hasn't happened yet. Well, that might have been God's preference for you, his plan for you. But that's a two-way street. To get to where he has planned for you and your destination, a lot of it's up to us. And we're going to talk about Moses today. And if you've known anything about me, I like to look underneath the surface. If somebody's messing up, I don't just look at the situation. I look at, man, what's caused them to be so jacked up in their life? What happened to them? Because, see, if we deal with the root of the cause, not just the symptom, then the symptoms will change. But we so often, even in our Western medicine, we like to put a Band-Aid on it. Don't get to the real issue, just the symptoms are bothering me. Let's just deal with the symptom. That's our weakness. Not necessarily so. You need to look at the root of the cause. And that's what we're going to do with Moses today. Anytime that you read a story about a character in the Bible, don't just read it as they went from A to B and here's what's happened in their life in a nutshell. If you like where they've ended up, if there's something that you admire about them, study their character. Study how they got to that place. If they messed up and they fell short of their destiny, dig a little deeper. Find out what was the cause. Because I don't know about you, but in my mind, I think if I had God said, coming down and talking to me audibly, and we had a conversation, and I knew exactly he said do steps one, two, and three, I don't know that I would have a struggle. Because if he said it, then I have faith in it. I believe it. I'm going to do it. And so it would boggle my mind when I would read about Moses earlier on or even those that they said the Lord said to me and he would audibly speak. It wasn't just a feeling or an impression. And if it wasn't audible voice, he would give you a dream and then explain the dream. And I would always have problems thinking, man, why did you, why did you get derailed? Why did you go down lane B when he said take lane A? Do you know how amazing it would be if you would hear actually God come and speak to you every single day, just like I'm talking to you? There's a few people in this world, I guess, that have that benefit. I'm not one of those. And it makes me kind of envious of those in the Bible that had that. But then I'm also just so perplexed when they don't do it. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't understand your thinking. So since I like to get to the bottom of things, I try to understand where are you coming from, that even if you heard God say something, it still didn't come to pass or you didn't follow it completely. So Moses, most of you know his story, but we're going to pick up after he has already grown up and he is now trying to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and into Canaan's land. 
Moses was a man that God had a plan, and part of Moses' plan was to lead his people out of bondage and into the Canaan land. He would tell him, you're going to take them to the promised land. I have a land for your people. You're going to take them there. He never once said, I'm going to take you to the wilderness. That's where I want you to be. When he talked with Moses, it was with the destination in mind. That's what he wanted Moses to keep his focus on. He says, you're going to take them to the promised land. That was God's preference. That was God's plan. But if you know your Bible at all, you know that Moses stopped short of his destination. He didn't make it there. So we're going to find out <clears throat> what <clears throat> the event was that caused God to keep him from going to the promised land, but we're not going to stop there. I always like the backstory. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into Moses' personality and see how maybe his story can relate to our story so that we don't get stopped short of our destiny. So we're going to pick this up in the book of Numbers, and I'm going to read in the 20th chapter. And what is going on at this time is they have been out in the wilderness for a while, and they're getting thirsty. And it says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. The people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam, who was Moses' sister, she died and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If we had only died when our brethren died before the Lord, why have you brought us up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord has, as he commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. The Lord told Moses, speak to the rock. What did Moses do? He hit the rock. When God tells you to speak, don't hit. And before we jump to the conclusion and go, oh, well, maybe it was an accident. No, you read along with me that he hit the rock not once, but twice. And he had a little bit of a venting moment before he even did this. Now, Aaron was Moses' brother, and he was his mouth, if you will say. Moses speaks plenty of time for himself after they get out in the wilderness, but at the beginning, Moses talks about his speech impediment, how he's slow of speech, and he doesn't want to speak to Pharaoh. But God's not going to let him get out of it that easy. He says, well, I will supply someone with you. Now, here's a problem with this. 
Aaron is yoked, if you will, to Moses. So, what Moses does reflects on Aaron. He didn't just say, Moses, <laughs> come here, we need to talk. Did I mumble? What part of speak did you not understand? But he called Moses and Aaron. I imagine when he called them up to the mountain, Moses probably said, come on, Aaron. Aaron's like, hey, dude, I'm not the one that hit the rock. You go. He's like, no, he wants us both to go. Dude, seriously. But here's the bad thing. God tells them, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but God tells them, you see that land? That's as close as you're going to get. But the problem is, Aaron dies. Moses doesn't die for a while later. But Moses tells Aaron that him and his Aaron son are supposed to go up on the mountain, God said. And Aaron has on his priestly garb. It's like, what are we going up here for, Moses? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. God wants, God wants us up here, though. He's like, what'd you do again, Moses? <laughs> when they get up there, he says, take off your priestly garb. Give it to your son. It's a transfer of power. And then when this episode is over, only Moses and the son come down the mountain. See, when you are leading people, it affects those that you lead. Whether you're leading in a household, a relationship, a church, your job, your leadership or lack of leadership doesn't just stop with you. I wished it would. That would be great. But the Bible says no man is an island, meaning whatever you do is going to affect somebody. So because Moses has this little issue that we're going to talk about, we see to what detriment that happens. Just because we can visualize where God wants to take us, maybe it's been prophesied over us, maybe we've had dreams, maybe all the doors are opening up to take us to that place, and we don't make it, we fall short of it, we have to look at ourselves. See, whenever we feel distant from God, we have to ask ourselves, what happened? Who changed? Moses didn't end up where he should have ended up, but he was a great leader. He was a great deliverer. And we're going to find out what his issue actually was. See, what happens so often in life is we, have, we shove stuff down our issues, and we think if we get in church enough, if we sing and raise our hands enough, if we read our Bible enough, then all these other issues will just poof, they'll just disappear. We'll just be delivered from them. That would be great. Maybe that happens to you. Certainly doesn't happen to me. God doesn't like to do shortcuts with me. I have to deal with things. I have to deal with issues. So Moses' problem was not a lack of being in the presence of God. And you would think that would fix everything, right? Because it says that when they didn't have water, him and his brother went and knelt at the tent, and the presence of the Lord surrounded them. He's always in the presence of the Lord, so that wasn't it. So that looks good on the outside, right? And it's not that he lacked knowledge or the word. God gave him the Ten Commandments, and then he actually spoke to the living word. He and God had daily conversations. So it's not that he wasn't in the Bible. So we can't point to those two things, can we? 
Now those will help you with your issues, but there's also still some work that needs to be done. So what is it? He, didn't, he wasn't immoral. He didn't have a problem with adultery. He didn't hit the, the wine too often. Those weren't his issues. So on paper, if we're going to line up all the things that he had done correctly, it looks really good. He should have went to the promised land. And it wasn't just because he disobeyed this one time that stopped him. This was a issue that he had in his background that God wanted to deliver him from. So what's his issue? When he hit the rock, he didn't do anything morally wrong, but he did something that was emotionally immature. He threw a little hissy fit is what he did in front of the people. He didn't control his feelings. His feelings controlled him. So what's his issue? He has an anger management problem. And if you're not one with anger issues, I bet you know somebody that has an anger issue. And what happens is they try to control their anger. They get coping skills. And while the coping skills help contain it, it doesn't deliver you from it. You're just keeping it at bay. It's still a constant struggle. And it's good to have those coping skills but you're just putting a Band-Aid on it. You have to get to the root of why it is that the temper is so short all the time, that the yelling comes so easy, that people have to walk on eggshells going, well, how's the mood today? Do we approach them today? Do we not approach them today? How's the boss today? Is today a good day to ask for the raise? For the raise? Oh, no, she's real upset today, or he's just been flying off the handle. Don't do it today. I got an anger management problem. Why do we have anger? Well, we can't just stop with Moses and go, well, too bad for him. Lost his temper. Guess God says never lose your temper. Mm, that's not it. We have to dig deeper. What is the root cause of his anger? Now, I haven't had a one on one conversation with Moses, so I have to just rely on his story. I have to read between the lines. I don't know what your story is, if that's your issue, but I know that your issue or my issue will keep us from reaching God's preferred destination for us. Doesn't matter how great we preach, how great we sing, how great we can lead, how talented we are at writing, our education, our knowledge, All of that is great, but if you have an issue that you haven't dealt with, you're going to fall short. I think one of the worst things that would happen in my life is at the end of my life for God to roll back that curtain and say, I want to show you something. I want you to see where I wanted you to be. I want you to see the people that you would have affected. I want you to see how the world would have been a better place had you stepped up, had you dived in. I want you to see the way that your children's lives would have been had you followed my plan. To me, that would hit me harder than anything. So while I'm still alive, I ask God, show me. Don't let me make an excuse for my issue. Show me my issues. Don't just show me my issues, though. Show me the cause of my issues and then help deliver me so that I don't stop short of all that you've got for me. I've already been hindered in my life thus far because of certain issues. I don't want that to continue on. 
I have to look at me. I have to look at my walk. And then the reason that I really have to do that is because I have people that depend on me. I have people that I affect in my world. And what I do or don't do correctly for God, they're going to have to reap the benefits or the consequences. You're a head of a household or you live in a household or you have children that you are molding and supporting and trying to be an example to. Whew. That magnifying glass, it's a big deal. Because see, you're molding their little lives. You're showing them how God is and how you should live. And what you do correctly will bless their little souls. What you do incorrectly can put a curse on their lives. It's a big deal. See, God says in the Bible that it's better that you had a millstone put around your neck and thrown into the sea than to harm one of his little ones. You know what a millstone is? It's not a pendant like this. Millstones could weigh up to 100 pounds. There's no getting around it. It goes down, you're going down with it. So if you don't want to deal with the issues for your sake, Deal with the issues for those that you love. And if you're a child and you're young and you're not knowing how to handle your emotions because your emotions are controlling you, think about what is causing you to act this way. That's what you need to deal with. You have a child at home that is constantly angry. Why? They're not born to just be angry. What's driving them? So here's the thing with anger. Anger is what they call a secondary emotion. It's not your primary emotion. Anger is a result of something. You're not just instantly angry over this issue. There's something that has caused you to get angry, and the anger is a result of that issue. The problem is, is he had an anger issue and he never processed it. He never dealt with it. Why? Because see, God was using him. So if God's using me, then I must be pleasing him. So everything is okay, right? Every time I come to church, I feel the spirit. I cry. I raise my hands. I read my Bible. I sing my praise songs. And that is all wonderful. But just because you are moving in that realm doesn't mean you don't have to deal with your issues because sooner or later, they're going to come up. You might think, well, you know, I haven't been angry in a long time. And that's good. But just because it's lie dormant doesn't mean you're delivered from it. How do you know if you're delivered from your issue? A situation will come up that we're going to stay with anger because we're dealing with Moses and that's his issue. And a situation will come up that normally you would have flew off the handle, you would have been angry. But you stopped and you controlled the emotion rather than the emotion controlling you. That's deliverance. That's deliverance. You have an anger management problem, and you're going to blow up. You're just going to walk away. But see, you're still stewing inside. It's just laying dormant. It's ready there to go. You're not delivered from it. Moses had an issue that he never processed, and he never dealt with it. But the problem was he assumed that his calling would heal it. See, Moses knew that he was called to deliver people. And he knew that he was raised an Egyptian but born a Hebrew, so he never really fit in either place. But by reading the story, it tells me that he related more to still being a Hebrew than an Egyptian. Because one day he's walking by and he's hearing a commotion and he sees an Egyptian slave beating a Hebrew man. 
And he's called to be a deliverer, right? It's his calling. So he goes to intercede. And he looks around, and he doesn't see anybody watching. And rather than just interceding and defusing the situation, he kills the guy. He takes him out, buries him in the sand. But he still thinks nobody's watching, that nobody sees. See, when we have issues, we think a lot of times we keep that behind a smile and nobody sees. We look around and nobody sees. But see, our perspective is different than somebody else's perspective. How do I know somebody saw? The next day he's out, deliverer, and two Hebrews are fighting against each other. He decides, I'm going to intervene. And he scolds them. What are you doing fighting each other? You're supposed to be for each other. And one simply turns to him and says, who made you our boss? What are you going to do, kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Oh, somebody saw. So now he runs because Pharaoh finds out about it and Pharaoh is after him. So let's see where some of the anger came from. See, anger actually is hurt turned inward. Anger is a result of an unmet need. Somewhere in your life, you have felt cheated. So because you felt cheated, I'm angry. Somewhere in your life, you have been hurt. So because I'm hurt, that emotion doesn't stay too long. It begins to turn to anger, the injustice in the situation. You were rejected. Everybody's been rejected. Somebody broke up with you. Somebody left you. You didn't get the job. You didn't make the team. You didn't get the promotion. You didn't get the raise. Everybody has dealt with rejection. But some people, when they deal with rejection, they take it as a personal insult to their personality, to the core of their being. And what happens? We get angry. We feel abandoned. We get angry. So let's look at Moses' story. Let's see maybe the underlying cause for this anger. Moses' issue is low self-esteem, rejection, and abandonment. He has three things going on. See, he feels abandoned because, I believe he feels abandoned, because his mama sent him down the river. Now, she had to, and he knows that, but still, he didn't get to grow up with his mama, with his brothers, with his sisters. And while she was able to nurse him, they called her to be a nursemaid, the minute that he was weaned, she was gone. She no longer raised him. So we have an abandonment issue. We have a rejection. She didn't keep me. Yeah, I know what the situation is, but still, she didn't keep me. And then he grows up, and the Pharaoh is raising him, but now we're kind of confused because we really don't fit in. We're kind of rejected by the Egyptians because we're a Hebrew, and we're rejected from the Hebrews because we're raised in a palace. Either way, he feels rejection. And then he's got this issue with his mouth. So already he doesn't want to speak. He knows what his weakness is. People reject him because maybe they don't understand him. So now we've got some anger building up because that's how we get through. And then he gets angry because the people he's trying to help don't want his help. See, Moses, but Moses can't be free until he finds out what the primary emotion is. What's your issue? What's the primary emotion? You find that out. You're on your, you're on your way to being delivered. You're on your way to success. 
Don't keep just stuffing it down because I go to church, I'm fine, I can feel God, I'm moving on up into my calling. But you don't want to fall short of the destination of your calling. We have to look at our issues. We have to look at where they came from. If you'll notice, when you're angry, you feel justified because you have an excuse, right? And we kind of know that here because I think that if Moses would have told God, I really messed up. You said speak. I hit. I threw a temper tantrum. God, I need your help. I, I need you to help show me what's wrong with me. I believe he would have got to see the promised land. But in all the readings, we don't see a, at all here where Moses, Moses knelt down and said, man, I messed up. I need deliverance. I need you to help me with this. Moses' anger didn't just cause him to stop short, but also those that he was leading. Only two from that group actually were able to cross over to the promised land. Now, why didn't he take out Aaron and Moses at the same time? Because Moses now had to groom somebody to be the leader. That wasn't God's preference. He wanted Moses to do it. But because of Moses' inability to deal with an issue, he now has called somebody else up to take their place. I don't want anybody else to have to take my place because of a shortcoming on my side. I want God to show me. Ugly moles, warts, and all. And I don't want to blame a person. I may, might say, I'm this way because this situation happened, but I don't want to stay that way. It's okay to say where it came from. It's not okay to let it keep you stuck. That's what happened with Moses here. See, we don't outgrow brokenness. I wished we did. I wish that, you know, we had this thing in 50, it's all good. But we don't. We have to address it and we have to fix it. And here is where Christians get hung up. It doesn't matter how much you grow spiritually, if you don't address it, the issue's not going to get fixed. It's still going to hold you back. Let you think about that for a little bit. He was rejected in his mind by his mama. He's rejected by the man that raised him, the Pharaoh, because when it was found out what he did, the Pharaoh wanted to take him out. He was rejected by the Hebrews that he was trying to help. And then now, if you'll remember, even in the first part of the verse that we read, he's feeling rejected again of why did you bring us out here? Why didn't you just leave us alone? We would have been better. He is rejected every single where that he goes. He needs acceptance. Everyone needs to feel accepted by somebody. And he doesn't feel that. He has an unmet need that produces pain that equals anger. He leads the people, but here's the problem. No one calls him out on his behavior. Aaron, who's supposed to speak with him, who is by him all the time, never says, dude, you're going to have to ease up a little bit. You're going off the rails here. Everybody needs somebody in their life that will do a reality check with them. Say, man, you're spinning out of control on this situation, and it's not really that big of a deal. What's up with you? Why are you treating people like this? What are you doing? God said, speak, and what are you doing with your rod? You lost your mind? Had he had a true person in his life that would have gave him a reality check, 
then maybe he could have seen the issues and started dealing with them. It, there's a saying that says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. They used to really confuse me because I thought, you know what, if a friend slaps me upside the face, I don't call them a friend anymore. But what it means is the truth hurts. But you need a friend in your life, somebody that's real with you, that won't tell you just what you need to hear. They'll say, man, you need to knock it off. You have some issues. You need to deal with them because it's coming out in all these areas. Nobody wants to be around you. Nobody wants to work with you. No, everybody's afraid to talk to you. You're not making any sense. What's up with you? You need somebody like that for a reality check. If Moses would have had that, perhaps things would have turned out differently. But nobody said anything to him. That's the other issue. Now we have leader ego, right? I'm the deliverer. I have this magic stick. God speaks, I do. I have everything all together. No, he didn't. He had some real issues that he needed to address. So he's dealing with rejection, but if he doesn't understand what's going on, he's just going to stay stuck. And so we can see some of these issues come out in other ways. Here's how we kind of know he has a rejection issue that turned into anger, is because he wanted to do everything himself. Even his father-in-law, and his father-in-law was finally somebody who did say, you need to change some things. He wanted to make all of the rules, all of the decisions, put his stamp of approval on every single case. Why? Why do you have to have everybody's approval? Why do people have to know if you were the one that came up with the idea? If you were the one that thought of it first. What's driving that? Why does it matter? Well, nobody thanked me. And yes, that is poor manners for nobody to thank you, but if God's trying to pull an issue out of you, think, why does it bother me that much? See, he was wearing himself out and griping about it, but he had set up this scenario. Come to my tent. I am the one that has God's ear. He speaks to me. I will tell you exactly what to do. And he was getting upset, wore out, exhausted, and getting angry at the people when he's the one that set it up that way. Why did he do that? He wanted to be accepted. He had rejection issues. So even though it was wearing him out, it was feeding a part of him that was unmet because people were coming to him for his counsel, for his opinion, for his wisdom. And Jethro, his father-in-law, went up there and said, Moses, <laughs> you're doing this wrong. In other words, it's going to bite you in the butt. You can't keep this up. So you find some people that you trust, put them over different areas, and have the people go to them. That's working smarter, not harder. Never sit under a leader that won't let anybody else do anything. They try to do it all. Why are they trying to do it all? Now, I know there are times, because I've had this happen to me, where nobody steps up. So if nobody steps up, guess what? If it's going to get done, you're going to have to do it yourself. But if you have people that are willing to do certain things, head certain committees, do it, oversee it, mentor them, groom them. But my gosh, if you want to do it all, you have to ask yourself, why? Do you want to do it all? What is driving me? The other thing is, is a control fanatic. We have to control it all. Why? Why do you have to control it all? 
Why do you have to know what this person is doing? Did that person do this? And I know the situation for this, and I can counsel them, and I can get this done, and I can go to this meeting, and I can head this one, and I can do this. Why? What's driving you so much? Well, we must be about the Father's business. Mm. Did God say to overextend yourself? I don't think so. So what's driving you? Well, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe the right thing to do, but is it the smart thing to do? You're just one person. Why do you have to stay busy? Well, I don't know. I never thought about it. Obviously, let's stop and think about it. Why do we have to control everything and everyone? Because you know why? It feeds a part of you that was unmet. You feel accepted. You feel included. You don't feel abandoned. You don't feel rejected. See, if you start dealing with those, the number one, everybody else's life around you is going to be a lot easier. If you tried to live with a control fanatic, it's insane. And if you don't know that, then maybe you're the control fanatic, and I'm telling you, it's insane. You, yeah, you need to have boundaries. You need to have guides, rules. I get that. But man, some people can just take it to the excess. And then I have to say, why? Why? Well, nobody else will do it. Well, then maybe you need to train them to do it. Maybe you need to hold them accountable to do it. See, we get those underlying issues addressed and start working on those. You're going to skyrocket in the calling that God has for you. But he can't take you where he wants to take you if there's issues that's hindering you from being where you are supposed to be. God, at one part, there's another part about Moses I want to bring out. So Moses was the control fanatic. He wanted everybody to come to him. The other thing is, is at one point, God knew that this group of people was going to hinder Moses from getting to his destination. Because he really wanted Moses to be in that promised land. So he tells Moses, I want you to get out of the way. These people will be no more, and I'm going to raise you up a group of people. He didn't just say you're not going to have anyone. He said, I'm going to raise you up a group of people. And he knew that this group of people that he would raise up would help Moses get to the promised land. But Moses says, no, don't do that. Yeah, I know they're causing me frustrations and everything else, and I know this relationship's not good, but it's comfortable. See, I know what to expect with these people. And these other people, they may not, like these people don't accept me all the time, but some of the time they do when they come to me for counseling. So don't take these people out. There's a time, going to come a time in your life where God may move some people out of your life. Because he has another group of people coming into your life to help you, propel you to where you need to go. But if you won't let go because you have an issue of feeling abandoned or I can't be in the unfamiliar, I have to stay, yeah, I'm miserable, but I'm comfortable here. I know what to expect with this kind of miserable life, these miserable people then you're going to stay right there. So when people leave out your life, don't do what Moses would have did and look at it as a rejection. Well, there's another friend gone. Well, there's another person gone. Well, there's another group of people that I lost. Look at it as, God, what are you trying to do? Am I running off these people because of my issues? Then I need to deal with that. But if I'm not having any issues, then maybe you're moving me on up to a new level with a new group of people that rather than pulling me down, will lift me up. Oh, 
then you're on your way to where God wants you to be. You're on your way to your promised land. We don't want unresolved issues to keep us from our God-preferred destiny. Handle it now before it costs those that he's assigned to you. For Moses, it was anger. For us, it can be control, workaholic, overcommitment, low self-esteem, pride. I don't know what your issue is. Only God will show me at times, and then that's when I will pray for you for those issues. But there's always an underlying issue. I know what mine are. But see, that song this morning helped me because my biggest issue is low self-esteem. Now, not low self-esteem in who God has made me, that sort of stuff, but low self-esteem in the fact of he's called me to a certain mission, and I never felt prepared. I was kind of like Moses, not that I'm slow in speech, but I never went to seminary. I'm not the right gender. I've never done anything like this. So see, that was my issue. It wasn't a lack of faith in God. It was a lack in faith in me. And so it's taken me a while to work through those issues. I give myself the pep talk every Sunday morning. I tell myself, you walk in there with your shoulders back. Don't walk up here like this. It's like, I know I'm just a humble servant. Because when I do that, it's going to bring the audience down along with me. If I stammer and stammer and barely talk up, you're going to think I don't even know what I'm talking about. So see, the way you carry yourself will help propel you to where you need to be. Get in the habit of walking with your shoulders up and back. It's not just good for your posture. It changes the energy around you. It puts the enemy on alert. Whew, they got their shoulders back. They're walking tall. Their head's up. They're not looking at the ground anymore. Poor pitiful me. No, it brings a different kind of energy to you. Find out what your issue is. Ask God to show you. What's wonderful is God won't just show you and then go, okay, on your own, bud. See you later. No, he'll help you deal with it. Don't you want to be free? Don't you want to get rid of that constant anger that just builds underneath the surface? That constant ache in your heart. The constant stress, the worry, the timidness, the I'm afraid to speak up. I'm afraid somebody's going to get mad. I'm afraid somebody's going to leave me. You don't have to carry that around anymore. That's just baggage. That's kept you from where God wants you to be. Don't let your feelings handle you. Start feeling, I mean, start handling your feelings. There are certain people that I've known for I don't even know how many decades, and the bad thing is I, there's a label that they have wore for the decades, and I keep waiting for them to rip that sucker off. You know, and one of them is, well, they're always depressed. How are you? Well, I'm tired. How are you? Well, it's been... I would love it if they would just shock me and go, oh, I'm great. I would do a double take. I'm like, God, you answered the prayer. Thank you. 40 years, but you've delivered them. Break your habits. If it's not a habit that is bringing good things to you, shake it up. See, you are in control. You shouldn't be out of control. Your life will be as great as you make it. But if you want a poor pitiful me about everything in your life, honey, it's not going to get any better. I don't care how much praise and worship you do. I don't know how many times you read the Bible. I don't know. It doesn't matter how many times you fall on your face because of God and his presence is so strong. If you don't bring that issue out to deal with it, 
It's never going to change. I hope that solves a little bit of mystery when you think, why is it? I read my Bible. I try. I read my Bible. I pray. I go to church every time the doors are open and I don't feel any different. Why don't you feel any different? It's because you've got an issue there that you're hoping that he will just slide over it and heal it as he goes by rather than you having to deal with it. But if you deal with it, not only will you set you free, oh, you'll set everybody else free. Maybe people that have known you in the past and go, what happened? Man, what did you do? And you can't say, oh, went to church. That's not going to fly with them because you've been going to church for 30 years. So what did you do? Well, I dealt with it. I looked in the mirror. There is nothing worse in my mind. Well, there's lots of things that are worse. I shouldn't say it that way. One of the worst things in my mind is when you have to pay for somebody else's mistake. For instance, you are now with somebody in a relationship, but because some yahoo back here did something, you have to pay for it. That's not fair. You're not them. But it's because they haven't dealt with that issue. They still just keep blaming people to do the same thing to them, and they haven't dealt with the cause of the issue. You get healed from the issue. It will change the way that you look at the world, God, and your relationships, and things will change. Let's don't be a Moses in the area of stopping short of where we need to be. Don't let it cost you or I. So was my sermon a little in your face? Yes, it was. But remember, faithful friends give you a wound that will help you. Bless you, Rick. Oh, I think it was for everybody, but. <laughs> Bless you. That's awesome. Bless you, Rick. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so uh, this needs to be a, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. So when we do this last song, there's a place right down here that I think you should leave it on the altar. I think that would be great. And anybody else that has an issue, leave it here. Now, I'm not saying it won't try to pop up, but by you dealing with it, acknowledging it, that's your road to success. We don't want to follow what Moses did. I didn't read one place in here after that that he went, oh, my bad. <laughs> I hit when you said speak. I'm bad. God is so faithful. He's so forgiving. This morning, see, we celebrate Labor Day tomorrow. Let's quit laboring so much in the areas where we need to be delivered from. Let's take our time and labor for God and lay our issues down at the altar. There's a, one last song that we're going to sing. Not we're going to sing, we're going to listen to. And it's called The Goodness of God. And that's all he is, is good. And that's all he wants to be to us is good. And things happen to us but if we'll turn it around and give it to him, again, it's for our good. Yeah. See, not only Moses' heart was broken, but man, God was disappointed. God's heart was broken. He talked to him all the time. Moses, this is what you're going to do. This is what I have for you. Wait till you see this land. You're not going to have to struggle. There's houses that's already built. There's crops already ready for the harvesting. This is going to be the best days of your life, and I have set it aside 
for you and your people. That's what I want to give you. So see, when we fall short of our destiny, not only is it a, oops, I'm bad, and the people that were depending on me lost out, but God's dream didn't come true. And for everything that he's done for you, or if the only thing that was done for you was his son hanging on a cross, if he's ever made any of your dreams come true, what an honor to make God's dream come true. Have you ever asked him, God, what's your dream? What's your dream for me? Where do you want me to be in my life? What do you want me to do? Let's make God's dream come true for a change. And when you get to heaven and you take your first eternal breath, how great would it be if he rolled back that curtain and he said, look, you were my dream come true. When I created you in the womb, I had a dream for you. And you didn't disappoint me. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you need a moment, take time. Ask God to show you. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you get to where you need to be. And let's all make his dream come true. Go ahead and just stay right where you are. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. How wonderful I think each of you are. You know, you see yourself in your weakness, but I see you in your strength. It touches my heart greatly to know that I'm with a group of people who's willing to better their self, who's willing to quit placing the blame, look in the mirror, and say, God, where are you wanting to take me? So dear Heavenly Father, this morning, I know as proud as I am of each and every one here, that's a drop in the bucket to how your heart must be swelling today. Lord, you see the hurts you know the thing that's happened in each and every one's story. And some people, while it's delivered them out of Egypt, they're still stuck in the wilderness. And you want to get them to the promised land. Lord, help them get unstuck this morning. Help them to move forward. Help them to acknowledge what happened to them. Lean on friends to help them. But ask them help them to deal with it and process with it so that they can put it into your hands and lay it at your feet so that you can make something beautiful out of the rest of their life. Lord, I don't want you to be blamed anymore because things didn't happen in their life. I want them to shine a light onto their life. Lord, let your Holy Spirit shine a light into their light, every corner of their heart, every recess of their mind, to show them where maybe they're stuck. You want each of them to end up in their promised land. You have plans for them. I don't want it to just be your preference. I want it to be a fulfillment of what you've called their life to be. Bless each and every one that's here. Heal those that were sick this morning. Keep those that are on vacation. Keep them safe until you can bring them back to us. And help us to Continue to keep your dreams in the forefront. No longer our dreams. Because if we fulfill your dreams, our dreams will come true. Lord, we don't want to ask you for any blessings this morning. We just want to ask you to help us be who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.